Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Our webinar today is entitled Community Campus Partnerships for Social Infrastructure, Lessons from Simon Fraser University and the University of Winnipeg Community Renewal Corporation. My name is Ted Jackson. I'll be your moderator for this webinar. I'm a Carleton University professor and a consultant. I've worked on these issues for some time. It is a pleasure to direct traffic today. Let me first recognize the sponsors of this event. Community Campus Engage Canada, a new national network. Community First or Suffice project at Carleton University. Simon Fraser University. The University of Winnipeg Community Renewal Corporation. The McConnell Foundation and the UNESCO Chair in Community-Based Research and Social Responsibility in Higher Education. Thank you to all. One of the key players in Canada that has been promoting post-secondary institutions to do more in partnering with communities to build social infrastructure is the McConnell Foundation, which through its RECODE initiative has funded projects, research, and dialogue on this theme. There's little doubt that uh, in that Canada needs to renew and expand its stock of affordable housing, daycare centers, seniors facilities, women's shelters, and much more. And that the, re the real estate and engagement capacities of universities, colleges, and institutes can be productively combined with the expertise and drive of community and nonprofit organizations and public and private and philanthropic financing to build green social infrastructure that advances social justice, environmental sustainability, and economic opportunity. The question, of course, is how specifically and effectively to actually do this. We have two presenters with us today who are leaders in this important space. They have worked with others to create new structures and facilities that are sustainable in multiple ways. Their knowledge is honed by real extensive practice. And we're very fortunate to learn from their experiences and lessons today. Let me introduce them now. Andrew Petter is President and Vice Chancellor of Simon Fraser University. From 1991 to 2001, he served as a member of the Legislative Assembly of the Province of British Columbia and held numerous cabinet portfolios, including advanced education and intergovernmental relations. Since becoming president, he's overseen the implementation of a strategic vision for the university that seeks to distinguish SFU as Canada's engaged university defined by its dynamic integration of innovative education, cutting edge research, and far reaching community engagement. In 2018, he was appointed to the Order of Canada in recognition of his national leadership in advancing university community engagement and higher education. Our second presenter is Sherman Kreiner, Managing Director of the University of uh, Winnipeg Community Renewal Corporation and UWCRC 2.0, which he will talk about. A community economic development practitioner for nearly 40 years, Sherman Kreiner served as Managing Director of the Renewal Corporation since 2005 and of its associated nonprofit 2.0 since 2016. He's led the construction of more than, you know, this number is $250 million in green social real estate projects, including mixed use, mixed income residential uh, towers, and the growth of uh, food services social enterprise with 100 employees. A former member of the Board of Regents of the University of Winnipeg and a founding director of the University of Winnipeg Foundation, in 2013, he received the university's 100th Convocation Award for exemplary service to the university. So we're gonna begin this webinar with a few short presentations from our presenters. Um, then we'll move into a question and answer period. If at any point those of you who are listening do have a question, please submit it through the chat box. So now, Andrew, why don't you get us started? Okay, let's see if the technology works here. Um... As I understand it, that should uh, give you a presentation. Does that work? That works. All right. So we're seeing a single slide that says campus, uh, community campus partnerships for social infrastructure. Yes, sir. 
Excellent. Well, look, Ted, thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be here to have the chance to speak on a topic that I think is really gaining traction at universities in Canada and around the globe. Um, and it's a topic that I am personally passionate about, uh, but I think it also represents a huge opportunity for post-secondary institutions. Um, and let me start with the uh, SFU experience. after an extensive consultation. And I would say this draws a lot on some of the previous experience of the university. So it wasn't made out of whole cloth, but it was very much founded on the belief that engaging communities would help us to make a better university, it would enrich the university. Students would gain a richer educational experience from engaging not only in the classroom, but in the community. Researchers who engage the community would gain opportunities to broaden their understanding and put their knowledge to work and universities that made community engagement a focus would gain a greater sense of purpose, social efficacy, employee gratification, and community support. And a prime example of how this is working at SFU on the student side is City Studio. This is a really great example of engaging students. It's a situation in which students are working for a full semester with the city of Vancouver on projects that benefit the city, including bringing pianos, if you can believe it, into this public space of the city as one of their initiatives. It's proved to be a huge win-win. The students have gained a wonderful educational experience, have had a chance to be mentored by uh, people uh, within the city, but also to lead amazing ideas, and in the process to gain a truly valuable educational experience. On the research side, uh, one of my favorite examples is the Hakai network. This is a network that was formed as a partnership with a foundation, the Tula Foundation, but also with the Helsic First Nation on the coast. And it was an initiative that took researchers, including postdocs and graduate students, into the uh, area, a beautiful area of uh, British Columbia, to work together with First Nations and with elders on land and resource management uh, in the ocean. And what has happened through that initiative, it ended a couple of years ago, but students and faculty came back not only with a great sense that they had made a contribution, but also having learned a whole about much, uh, a lot about the local ecosystem from elders. And it was truly a wonderful example of co-creating knowledge of an enriching experience, which again was beneficial to the researchers as much as the researchers were beneficial to the community uh, in which they were operating. On the sort of community engagement side, I mean, all universities uh, engage in some forms of community engagement, but we've really tried uh, to dig deep on this uh, with a number of initiatives. Uh, one of my favorite is SFU Public Square. It came out of the vision. And what we do is year round through SFU Public Square, we try to engage the public in conversation, in dialogue on important issues. And once a year, we hold a 10 day community summit on an issue of major importance. This year, it's gonna be on the disinformation age and we're going to uh, be engaging with literally thousands of people who will come out to various fora uh, to participate, but also through social media and through the web, uh, tens, indeed hundreds of thousands of others have participated in the past and I look forward to them doing so again uh, this year and some of you online may want to join in that conversation. So those are the three sort of obvious areas in which one might think to build social infrastructure, leveraging off our education, research, and community engagement focus. But a few years ago, we convened with the support of McConnell, a round table, uh, based on a paper done by Coral Strandberg, and this is the paper, I won't read the title, uh, you can see it there, uh, to look at all the instruments that universities have to build social infrastructure. Education, research are obviously two important ones, but what the paper points is that we have a whole bunch of other instruments that maybe we're not utilizing to the extent we could if we really believe in using the capacity of universities to contribute to social infrastructure, physical, financial, and relational. And let me give you a few examples of how SFU has uh, been developing social infrastructure in those spaces, um, some of which predate the vision, some of which uh, post-date it. Predating it, University City. We used land on the top of Burnaby Mountain to create a community. And in doing so, we've not only created uh, housing for 5,500 people, soon to be 9,000, but we've also used it as an opportunity to model sustainable practices. In fact, it has the greenest child care on the planet, soon to be Canada's second living building. And what I love about that building is it not only demonstrates you can produce a highly sustainable structure, but it's doing so at well below the market price for a conventional facility. 
In terms of uh, another category, the financial category, and I know Winnipeg has some experience in this too, but we've really tried to use our financial resources in ways that reflect social responsibility and that show we can, we can contribute to social infrastructure. So when our contracts for food service workers expired, what we did was uh, we provided in the uh, request for proposals guarantees that the employees we currently employ through contractors would be retained by future contractors at the same or better rates of pay and with job security. Uh, they're valuable people. Many of them have been on the university a campus a lot longer than I have, and it showed a degree of social responsibility, but it retained people who understood the university and were better able to contribute to us going forward. So it retained social infrastructure for the community and stability for these workers. It benefited the university. Another example, and I know that, uh, that time is running out, so I'll be quickly, quick here, but another example is some of our community programming where we're reaching out in the downtown east side of Vancouver or reaching out into schools and giving opportunities for our faculty, our staff to engage with local communities and help those communities to gain real benefit back. Uh, one of my favorite examples actually comes out of our library. Our library, of course, has wonderful resources, many of them digital, but they're hard to access and many of them are behind paywalls. So what we've done is we've, with the support of uh, some donors, we've supported them, and that program is making library resources available to uh, NGOs and community groups around the province who can draw on those resources to support their work and their activity. So those are some of the ways in which we're drawing on those additional levers. With the support of McConnell, we're not only doing it alone, we formed a collaborative for social infrastructure where a lot to go Together with other institutions in BC, we're sharing experience, exploring ways in which we can make the best use of some of these, these different instruments to really build social infrastructure. And we believe by doing that, not only are we benefiting the communities we serve, but as I say, I think we're providing a better education for our students, a richer research environment for our faculty, and the communities that we serve are more appreciative of us, more ready to support us, and I dare say governments are viewing us more positively as a result too. So I hope that gives you a bit of a slice of the approach we've taken to building social infrastructure and uh, of the direction that uh, is underway here at SFU. Terrific, thank you. Uh, let me just uh, want to keep us moving here and we've got a number of questions coming from people registered in the webinar uh, for later. So we want to get to those. But let me just ask you one question, Andrew, right now. And that is in these partnership projects, what are some of the concerns or priorities of the Board of Governors uh, at your university, and how do you engage with them in this work? Well, it's funny because I just came from a board meeting where we <laughs> did a presentation much like this one to the board. Hmm. I think uh, we've been very fortunate. We have a board that is fairly broadly representative of community interests, and they see this as a real positive, and they've been very supportive. They obviously want to make sure that where we are adding capacity, we're doing it responsibly. They and we want to make sure that we're not transferring resources out of key academic areas and priorities or research areas. So this is additive, not substitutive. And to make sure that in doing so, we're not, uh, we're not displacing uh, funding we might get for other purposes uh, that are of a higher priority. Although I must say, I think the board has very much brought, bought into the view that this whole exercise, this whole approach is in fact good for the university in the ways I've described and is highly supportive. It probably helped that this is grounded in our vision. The vision document itself was approved by the board. The board was involved in the consultations that led to that vision. And so we had a high degree of buy-in from the start. Mm -hmm. But it took some effort to get there, I would think. Uh, it took some effort. Uh, I've, I've been fortunate, as I admitted at the outset, uh, in that this university, even though it was originally located in glorious isolation on top of a mountain, has never been content to think of itself as an ivory tower removed from the community. Mm -hmm. And in various ways, be it co-op education, be it the other two campuses we've created, be it a lot of uh, action research, has in fact been undertaking uh, community engagement and social infrastructure building uh, even before the vision, I think what the vision helped to do was provide some coherence and momentum to those efforts. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a tremendously rich experience and innovative experience. We will come back to it. Let me move on now to uh, Sherman Kreiner. Um, Sherman, can you take us through your, uh, your experience at the University of Winnipeg? Um, thanks. Thank that was a fascinating presentation, Andrew. I was glad I was here to hear it. 
And thanks uh, from, to McConnell and Ted and everybody who's organized this. Um, so I'm gonna talk uh, just briefly about the University of Winnipeg Community Renewal Corporation. It is a uh, special purpose corporation that was created in 2004 to deal with the development requirements that were anticipated as the university moved from being a small university to being a mid-sized university. We were about 6,000 students, and in two years, we went to 10,000 students in a place that was already uh, overcrowded. And we needed to have a focus on being able to do the development that we needed to just keep up with the uh, um, uh, challenges that we saw in front of us. It is separately incorporated, not-for-profit charitable organization. Half the board uh, is drawn from the university community. The president is uh, uh, is the chair ex officio. The rest of the board is drawn from the neighborhood and downtown communities. We were particularly focused on wanting neighborhood representatives on the board from the outset so that we did not get into a situation where community is saying, well, you didn't consult with us. You didn't consult with us extensively enough. You didn't consult with us soon enough. That community would be at the table right from the outset. The initial mandate was to develop a sustainable university community. Uh, we focused that initially on environmental sustainability. We, uh, Lloyd Oxworthy was a brand new president at that time. We committed to Kyoto compliance, which we achieved, but we recognized that our sustainability vision really went beyond environmental and included social, economic, and uh, uh, cultural sustainability. So we sort of built this on the World Commission on Environment and Development Pillars of Sustainability. We also, um, we then did 18 months of consultation before we put a shovel in the ground and developed 10 development principles, which you can see on the screen there. Uh, and the thinking is that when you look at our entire body of work, you should see reflected in it, the four pillars of sustainability and the 10 development principles. Maybe not in every project, but when you now look back at this 15 years later, if we haven't succeeded in having you recognize those elements in what we've done, we haven't met the mandate that we set out for ourselves when we, uh, when we commenced. Hold on. Um, we've done about $250 million in uh, social real estate development, academic, commercial, and residential. A lot of that has been housing related. We've continued to scale up the housing as we've been successful in getting interest. As a part of our commitment to social sustainability, it's not just housing for students and student families, but also for our student families in our neighborhood, whether they are students at our university or not, and whether they ever will be students at our university. And similarly, the childcare that we have uh, expanded to uh, meet the changing demographics and the increased number of student families, in addition to the availability for students, students and their children, also available to the community more broadly. The other projects that we've done, we've really focused on community partnerships, community access, community resonance. So for example, the health at RecPlex uh, that we constructed, we've created a community charter. It's actually modeled on something that was done in Vancouver after the Vancouver Olympics to make sure that there was continuing community access. So one third of the time of that facility is made available to the community. And there's a coalition of 24 youth serving agencies in our neighborhood that meet together. So it's not simply open gym time, but organized activity for um, community children. In addition to the real estate development, we also uh, decided uh, that we needed to change our food delivery and our food service. We were now expanding the number of meal plan students and um, we stood out among terrible food services in Canada as the worst of the worst. McLean's would write stories about how horrible our food service was. Uh, and that, um, uh, we, that we went through one corporate provider to another and it was just bad or really bad or horrible and that we would just take on trying to solve Optus. Uh, we created a social enterprise, partnered with an uh, anti-poverty organization, a large one here in Winnipeg called Seed Winnipeg. And we built an organization that focuses on sourcing food locally, sourcing organically and where it can't be sourced locally, 
getting as much free trade product as possible. We have a workforce of about 100. Two thirds of the workforce is drawn from new Canadian indigenous communities, mostly in the neighborhoods surrounding the university. Diversity has won a very large number of both cooking and sustainability awards. It's made us the most sustainable food service in Canada. And we've now expanded diversity so that about one third of its business is off campus. Part of the reason for that was to create uh, full-time quality jobs because our university is quite cyclical. There's eight months of lots of activity, and four months of lots of not activity. And we were looking for ways to keep people working for those four months in businesses that were in circumstances that were consistent with our values. So we have a contract with an environmental center and we have a contract uh, with an indigenous owned golf course, for example, in, uh, in the city of Winnipeg. I think it's a really good example of a successful anchor institution strategy. I think there's a lot of talk about what an anchor institution strategy is. Uh, here's some of the elements that have made this work. The university leadership has been a public champion for the social enterprise. Lloyd in particular would talk about it everywhere, anywhere, any opportunity that he had to raise the profile of it. We got firm procurement agreements from the university prior to startup. So it wasn't just, will you hire us? Can we get some work? It was all in. All of our food service locations went to diversity. It created a protected market. And because we had a multi-year agreement, there was space for mistakes. We made plenty of them. We didn't fail because this mistake, we were so close to the edge that this one put us over or that put us over. And there was support from uh, dedicated development organizations, both ourselves and SEED in terms of investment dollars and management and government expertise that we had from our staffs and our boards um, serving uh, on other social enterprises. And finally, we've now gotten to the spot where the university's development is um, slowing down. We've caught up what we needed to catch up in terms of capital expansion. We recognize some of the challenges of accessing resources right now. And we had to make a decision about what to do. We built up a dozen years of uh, expertise. One option was to just say, that was great. You guys did a great job and shut down. Uh, and I guess uh, alternatively, we looked at, could we continue to build on what we did well in an environment that was a little more broad than just the university? We've decided to focus on values-driven downtown development. And uh, as we have done with our housing uh, projects, we are focusing on um, mixed, mixed income uh, residential development that is uh, helping the renaissance of our downtown, but is not on our campus and is not specifically aimed at meeting uh, needs of our campus community. All right, thank you. Thank you both, by the way, Andrew, thank you very much for your presentation. And Sherman, this is also a very rich experience. Um, let me just ask you one question before we get into the broader uh, discussion. And that question is really around the mix of sources and strategies that you've used to finance, uh, particularly your residential projects. What's been your experience there, just uh, in brief? Everyone's been its own interesting corporate finance challenge, Ted. I think uh, we've looked at a variety of different sources from direct borrowing from the province to a bank borrowing from a private market bank financing with or without guarantees. Uh, we've looked at federal housing programs and then we've looked at supplemental incentive programs which are available, aren't available, are appropriate for this project or are not appropriate for that project, for example, tax increment funding programs that would be available in the downtown. We have a program here in Winnipeg uh, that you can get a PST tax credit if you have a certain number of affordable units. So we've really looked at what opportunities exist for uh, support for affordable housing and they ebb and flow. And as they ebb, uh, I guess we, you know, we've looked for uh, uh, impact investment opportunities um, and they are they also ebb and flow. Hopefully they are gonna expand uh, in a more organized way than they have. Generally impact investing is uh, it's great. Uh, it's very expensive money. So just trying to find the right balance to still make this work, maintain affordable rents, but put a package together that will have a viable deal. Mm -hmm. So being agile and, 
and creating uh, what you need uh, as conditions change is, is crucial. Yeah, All right. Uh, great. So let me ask you both a couple of questions uh, just to get things moving um, a little more generally. Um, I want to ask the question of you and, and Andrew, perhaps you could start uh, on this question. Um, how can governments at various levels incentivize universities and colleges to increase their ambition and scale uh, in community partnerships for social infrastructure? What should they be doing to uh, make more of this happen or at least help make it happen? Well, I think I, I start by saying I think uh, universities and post-secondary institutions have an incentive to have government do more because if government see you're doing more with their dollars, they're more likely to give you those dollars to mm. do those things. Yeah. So uh, I, I think alerting government to the opportunity that if they're investing in a program, that program can produce additional benefits beyond those that they might normally expect. And building that into their assessment process can be helpful. So for example, we're looking at uh, major new infrastructure developments uh, in our uh, Surrey campus. We're talking to government about the public use of those, the extent that our 400 seat lecture theater will in fact provide a very valuable community facility. Uh, when we talk to government about uh, investing in, uh, in, in new programs, such as the new energy program there, we talk about how that program will support the government's uh, efforts to try to reduce carbon footprints. And we're partnering with the city of, Ang of, of Surrey in that regard, who has, by the way, funded us to create a chair who will work with them to reduce their carbon footprint through their transportation uh, policy. Mm. So I think it's a matter of, of, uh, of, of making governments more aware of the added benefits that can be provided to communities um, uh, and where those benefits align with government priorities or government interests uh, to have government uh, better recognize and credit those as part of their decision making. Mm. What I want to be careful about though, and I do think it's important to alert this, uh, I don't think it's in the interests of society or of universities to have government think that they can simply uh, offload responsibilities onto post-secondary institutions that are more properly or more efficiently served by government themselves. So I think we have to be careful that we're showing that we're adding value in areas where government hasn't and wouldn't invest in other ways, uh, or that our, the investments they're making through us are more, more, more effective and, and more likely to produce the positive results. That, uh, that, that, that we believe are, are, are potentially gonna flow from those investments. Okay, thanks. Sherman, what's your take on this? I think I generally agree with that. I think that you know the sweet spots that we have found are in projects where there is both a community, uh, community benefit and a university benefit. I mean, I think that's also a benefit to the university that there is that community benefit occurring, but when you're able to create housing for community, when you're able to create child, uh, care spaces for community, when you're able to create access to an uh, indoor soccer facility for the downtown immigrant community. I mean, that, those are the projects where uh, I think the, you get the uh, strongest traction with government um, most rapidly. And I also think it helps create, a, especially for us, we're landlocked downtown university. It creates a sense of our university that we are a part of the, of the community, that we are creating a village in the city as opposed to an ivory tower. And we had years and years of being an ivory tower. If you looked at our buildings, they were inward looking buildings. You were not welcome if you didn't have a reason to be in mm. that, those buildings. And we put a lot of effort into opening them up, having field houses with windows on all sides so people can see in and see, uh, you know, people that are in the, uh, that are working out there are playing a sport or something like that. And I think it has a huge positive impact on the university's brand um, to be able to engage with community in that way. Mm. Thank you. All right, let me ask you both something about the difficulties or resistance to some of this work. Uh, we know, and I certainly know this, that uh, when you do community partnership work, uh, there are pockets of the university, certain uh, units or, or voices that, um, in fact, oppose this uh, role for the university. They say it's, you know, it's community development. This is not what universities should do. What's your experience in, in dealing with this sort of thing? And, and um, what would you advise other people to 
to do in these cases. Um, let's start with Sherman first on this. So I think this is more a university president's question than a question for <laughs> uh, but, but I but I do think there, you know, there are a range of views about uh, what's the proper role for a university. And I think one of the, uh, you know, is community development or an appropriate role or not an appropriate role. I'm obviously a strong proponent on the, of course it's appropriate and it has many benefits and you create a learning laboratory for students around sustainability in a way you couldn't possibly do by simply talking about it in a classroom. Mm -hmm. We have tried to insulate some of this uh, concern by having a separate corporation. So there's no commingling right. of funds between our development corporation and the university. We've never received a penny of operating support from the university. That doesn't mean we haven't been accused of it by, you know, by people who have a particular point of view around this. But we tried to be really careful about that so that this is seen as a value add, not a value take that might lead to a value add um, later on. And, and just the flip side of this is, aside from the internal responses in the university, then there's the community responses. You know, what are you really doing? Mm -hmm. this is a big bad university and you've always been a big bad university and every university is a big bad university so there's a hidden agenda here and we remember what you did in 1996 and we'll never forgive you for doing that so i think it really is trying to walk uh, uh, a, a line and a balance between concerns that would be raised on both sides of the spectrum here around uh you know a proactive development initiative like this Okay. Andrew, what's your perspective on this? Well, it's interesting, listen to Sherman, because it shows how you can achieve similar objectives through very different means. Because in fact, our approach has been not to segregate, but to integrate the commitment to community engagement and, and the building of social infrastructure very much into the fabric of the university. Now, I think this has a lot to do with the university and, and, and the culture of the university and the moment in time. So I'm not saying that uh, one approach uh, will work elsewhere just because it works here or vice versa. I do think for us, um, what's been really important is showing the value add to the core aspects of the university to show that students really are gaining in terms of their educational experience and enrichment. Um, to find champions within the university amongst the faculty who are engaged in co-creation or action research, working with First Nations, to have them talk about the value of that research and the difference that it's making to them as researchers as well as to the community. So you have champions. It's not the administration talking uh, across to faculty or across to students, but there are champions within uh, those bodies as well. And I think the other thing is uh, the, the benefit to, 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 to constantly link it to the benefit that it brings to the university in terms of reputation and support. And I think there's a feeling at SFU that our identity as an engaged university has helped to lift the university's profile and reputation in ways that are not limited to initiatives that fall within this area. Uh, that governments tend to look more favorably upon us, that partners want to engage with us, that donors are more ready to contribute to us because they see us as a university that is more approachable, more open. And those donations may end up, you know, supporting fundamental research in a lab. They may end up uh, supporting uh, fairly traditional teaching approaches or scholarships and bursaries for students who are engaged in more traditional forms of education. But it's constantly making sure that that message is there, that it's credible, engaging with people who are concerned. I wouldn't for a moment pretend that everyone in the university is on board with the vision, but uh, hopefully most people see the vision and what it's led to as beneficial and beneficial to the university as a whole, not just to the objectives that we've been concentrating and focusing on here today. All right, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, we had, uh, as I said, we have 60 or so uh, registrants for this webinar. We had a number of questions before we got started uh, when uh, people registered. So I, I've grouped uh, these questions uh, together in uh, three different groups. We're gonna work our way through them. Um, and the first set of questions um, are, are really around uh, indigenous issues and, uh, and vulnerable groups. So. Tanya has asked the question, how do you see the issue of reconciliation, the role of the indigenous community in these partnerships? And clearly you're both uh, engaged uh, with the indigenous community. So um, 
interested in hearing a bit more about that. Um, uh, Fleur uh, has a question around um, Indigenous uh, First Nations and Métis health and what kind of social infrastructure, particularly on the outside of academia, uh, could be useful in this, in this area. And Nancy uh, has raised the question of examples of partnerships that uh, aim to build the resilience of the most vulnerable and marginalized populations uh, in the communities. Um, so um, why don't we start here with Sherman, but uh, both of you be very good to hear from both of you on this. Sherman. So our university ha uh, has a commitment to indigenization, which they do in a number of different ways in the academic and research components of their work that I'm not really going to, I don't feel like I'm in a position to speak to in the depth that would, uh, would be appropriate to, to give a sense of that. So I'm going to talk about it really from the capital and development side. And I feel like um, there's certain structural barriers that exist for uh, indigenous and disadvantaged people uh, coming to university. They may be coming as 30 year olds with children and not as uh, uh, sequential students who need to live in a dormitory. So you need to have housing options, for example, that are going to be family friendly housing options with enough families there for social supports that would be um, connected with that. And then other supports like uh, ha making sure there's adequate childcare, uh, making sure that uh, there's food security so that there's good nutritious food for, you know, for you and your uh, family. And then specific design elements to incorporate cultural activities. So we, for example, create spaces in our residences and in our academic buildings for, uh, for smudging ceremonies. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, uh, we have a separate space in our recplex for um, drumming circles. Um, what we sort of found here was there's lots of desire for drumming circles in Powell. So it's really hard to find a place in the inner city to do that. If you do it in a church, the church pretty much shuts down all the rest of its operations while this is going on. So we basically created a space that is a beautiful but soundproof space. So you can go in there and practice your drumming, practice your powwows, and um, uh, and um, develop cultural activities that can then be represented back to the larger communities in our annual powwow or the other things that we do here that are uh, culturally supportive of the indigenous community. Also looking at what other things could you build? You know, can you build a clinic? Um, is there a need for a clinic if you build a clinic? Both uh, can the clinic be culturally sensitive, but also can you build a clinic that is a has a large enough space and a large enough mandate that it can serve the larger community? Again, our larger community here is uh, mostly Indigenous and New Canadian folks. So, to the extent that we create things that have community access, the community access is to those communities. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Well, I really appreciate this question because it has become a major focus that we put what we're doing in community through the lens of, of making sure we are directing our resources where we can to support the most vulnerable populations. It's particularly in mind with us because the downtown east side of Vancouver is the, the poorest postal code in, in the country. And because our campus in Vancouver is proximate, in fact, intentionally, uh, our most uh, recent, well, one of our most recent facilities, our, our School for Contemporary Art, was placed in that area as a force for revitalization, but not gentrification of that area. So we have, for example, uh, with the support of Van City Credit Union, created an Office of Community Engagement, which is working with uh, groups in the downtown east side. It is so important. And it's hard for universities, but it's so important if you're going to engage in this work to do it on the basis of mutuality, mutual respect, mutual benefit, mutual understanding. If it looks like you're doing it uh, for purely philanthropic reasons uh, as a do-good institution, I can assure you that uh, there are more than enough people <laughs> who have been turned away by groups <laughs> with that intention, who may, who may have the best of... Uh, best of intentions, but it's really important that we have researchers and students and programs that work together. So I'll give you a few, a few examples. Uh, we have a program called Friends of Simon, which has students working in schools with newcomer uh, families and kids to help those, those kids to adjust to, uh, to schooling and has been very successful in helping uh, kids from those 
uh, backgrounds from immigrant, immigrant kids and others to be more successful in the school system. And the students who provide that service have gained hugely through mentorship and understanding. Um, we've taken on a major commitment to refugee settlement uh, both within the university and admitting students and, and scholars at risk, but also working in the community. And in fact, our chancellor rolled up her sleeves and went out to Surrey working with people in Surrey. We expect Surrey to be designated as Canada's first city of refuge as a result of those efforts. Um, so there's, th th that is a major focus and a major lens. On the indigenous side of uh, the equation, uh, particularly following um, the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we felt we had to do something that was more all embracing and not just a series of discrete initiatives. So we essentially replicated a kind of engagement process that had led to the vision itself called the Aboriginal Reconciliation Council, which engaged in a very deep discussion within the university, quite a painful discussion at times uh, on the history of residential schools and education and its contribution to, uh, to, to many of the the challenges faced by Indigenous peoples, but also reached outside the community with First Nations. And that uh, process has resulted in a report with uh, calls to action to the university in the education and research side, um, but also in many other ways uh, that we're acting upon. Um, in terms of the social um, infrastructure initiatives that I talked about earlier, we're trying to leverage all those uh, various instruments I talked about to support Indigenous economic and social development. So a, a few quick examples. Um, on our procurement policy, we really are trying to uh, ensure that we provide opportunities for Indigenous businesses and Indigenous providers and give them uh, priority where possible on, the, on procurement. Uh, in health, we partner with the First Nations Health Authority, which is a unique body in BC, on research and on assisting them in, uh, in trying to address uh, health needs within First Nations communities. And we partner with Fraser Health, which has a very significant Indigenous population uh, of, uh, of not only First Nations, but uh, non-status Métis, um, to work on health issues there. So it's a matter of on each of these instruments, making sure that we're incorporating our commitment to reconciliation and to empowerment of First Nations and First Nations communities within those and asking ourselves in each instrument, not only can we how, how can we maximize the value of the instrument, but how can we make it work particularly to benefit Indigenous communities consistent with the commitments we've made coming out of the ARC process and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Okay, thank you. Um, there were a couple of questions on um, how you measure the impact of these partnerships. Um, this is a really interesting question and people are thinking about this. Uh, it's an issue, if you will, in motion. Um, Sherman, do you want to start on that and make a few comments about measurement or evaluation of success? Well, um, I, again, I think my focus is probably a little bit narrower, but for example, on diversity foods, we have set a bar for the number of employees that come from the uh, Indigenous and New Canadian community. If we don't hit that, that, while the business might be successful, that would be a failure. Similarly, on the local procurement, we set a objective about how what level of um, local procurement we are trying to achieve here uh, uh, mm -hmm. and that we don't want to compromise around that and we don't want to compromise around issues of environmental sustainability so it's some of it is fairly absolute to make sure that you don't start having a slippage from here to here to here to here so every package that comes out of every food service center at our university is compostable does it all get composted no, no, no way in the world it all gets composted. But I, it really sets a, 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 a metric around being able to achieve that. On uh, community housing, we have set standards that say these many apartments need to be made available for community residents. Uh, you know, we might say they have to be student families, but it's not just that we want to have community residents living in our, uh, res in our, in our residential buildings but we wanna have this percentage. It won't be exact. There'll be years we're a little over, years we're a little under, but by setting a specific metric around that, we sort of assure uh, uh, an expectation and then ultimately a deliverable around that. So on, on uh, you know, ac access to our uh, 
court support facilities, access to our daycare, access to our residents. We're not just simply saying, yeah, we want this to be student and community, but we want it to be community defined in a particular way and that you can tell us whether we've succeeded or not because we've set a, a numerical standard about what it is that we're trying to achieve. Andrew, thoughts on measuring impact? This is a really important question and a real challenge, uh, one we're very focused on. We're, we are one of the few, I think maybe the only research university in Canada that uh, ha is accredited through uh, a U.S. accreditation process that requires us to report out on outcome measures. And we're also involved with other uh, 16 other institutions in uh, looking at the Carnegie designation process and how it might apply to Canada. And obviously, this is a key question there. Uh, in some areas, uh, it's easier than others. So housing was mentioned, and certainly at university, we can we can count the number of units and the number of residents. Uh, that's relatively simple. But when it gets to trying to figure out the value in a in a less tangible way, I, I would confess we are still struggling and and looking at input measures or proxy measures uh, in the education side. You can talk about the number of students who are involved in co-op education or involved in service learning, and we can see rises there. But does that mean that the quality of of the impact they're having in community is, is commensurately large, that becomes a much harder thing to measure and to disaggregate from other efforts that are being uh, made. Um, uh, similarly with research, we can count the number of collaborative research uh, projects that are taking place, the, the number of, uh, uh, of First Nations we're, we're working with. Uh, indigenous language was mentioned earlier, we're leading a major project on in Indigenous languages. But again, I recognize that that's sort of a halfway house between saying, uh, um, are we actually having that positive impact? And that's probably in the case of indigenous languages, the longer term prop proposition. Uh, to what extent are we able in our contribute to our contribution to preserve um, and hopefully revitalize indigenous languages? I, I hope they become preserved and revitalized, but even if they do, is it because SFU had a program or is it because we're all putting our efforts together? So it's a real challenge, uh, but it's an important one because I think mm -hmm. we need to demonstrate that the value of what we're doing as best we can and try to move as best we can from input and proxy measures to real measurements of value, provided they're credible and uh, provided we can demonstrate, uh, demonstrate their, uh, their reliability. Yeah, I know there's some really good work going on with uh, among the members of uh, Community Campus Engage Canada and also the Suffice Project and a number of other uh, groups and centers around the country. So uh, that's an opportunity for some more dialogue and, and uh, refinement of those kinds of uh, measures. Um, I want to ask now my colleague Alex Hine to come in and, and bring us some more questions uh, from... Uh, our participants and Alex, can you uh, join us and, and bring us some questions? Absolutely. Um, so we have a question from Jordan Shavino, uh, Andrew, and he asks, Andrew, do you have a relationship either formal or informal with the city of Vancouver? And if yes, what does this look like? And if no, would you be interested in one? And what would you envision this looking like? Well, you'd be happy to know the answer is yes and no. <laughs> we have both formal and informal relationships with the city of Vancouver. Uh, the city studio initiative I talked about uh, earlier uh, certainly has been formalized and it involves not only SFU. I saw another question about collaboration amongst institutions. Uh, that, that initiative grew out of a program called Semester in Dialogue. Uh, which is a great program, but as it morphed into City Studio in partnership with the city and, and formalized, uh, we also uh, have brought in other institutions and students from other number of other post-secondary institutions are very much involved and engaged in that. In fact, it's on its way. It may already be there to becoming an NGO in its own right. Um, uh, but we also have many, many informal relationships with the city of Vancouver. They support our public square um, financially and in other ways. And, uh, and we are closely related to them in terms of trying to support their housing strategy by, for example, hosting uh, facilitated conversations. Uh, we have a strong uh, strength in dialogue and facilitation, a great dialogue center in Vancouver. We try to provide that capacity to the city 
um, when they have issues that they want to uh, explore and, and have uh, discussions with stakeholders and the like, we very often host those discussions at cost and facilitate them. So I would say there's a wide variety of relationships, some more formal than, than others. They're not embraced uh, by a single uh, a set of uh, a principles or a single uh, a relationship. They are, are various, but some are formal and some are less so. What else, Alex? What else do you have? Sure, we have another question from uh, Crystal Tremblay, and she specifically thanks Andrew and says hello to. I everybody. can't. I can't hear. The, uh, I can't hear you, Alex. This is Sherman. Pardon me. Sorry. I'll, can you hear me now? Uh, in a very muffled way. Oh. Now is that a little bit more clear? So, yeah. Fire away. Let's see when get. All right. So we have a question from. Chris Tremblay, and she writes that she's been thinking more about how universities in a region might better collaborate through a collective impact approach on some key challenges. Our higher education is so geared towards competition, both within the university and beyond, and she's wondering how this might change and would love to hear um, any of your thoughts on this. Sherman, you want to start on that? I don't think I, I'm really in a position to say a whole lot about that. I think that... Um, you know, in our little world, our universities tend to be fairly competitive with each other in ways that I think mean that opportunities are lost. One of the things that has been encouraging for us is that as we have developed the capacity, development capacities that most universities don't have, that other universities are now reaching out to us around this area of expertise and saying, can you help us? Uh, Brandon University, for example, has... Uh, acquired a large uh, swath of land in, in, an, uh, in an impacted area of downtown Brandon, and we have been working with them around exploring the feasibility of a range of academic and non-academic uses for that space and a range of financing options that might be available, given what we know about uh, provincial sources of financing and others that would help them implement whatever plan it is that they, that they develop. I, I'm sort of hoping that you know, this conversation can open up a broader conversation through uh, McConnell or others around taking this expertise and use, u utilizing it and helping others think about, for example, the discussion that Andrew and I were having really early on. Do you do this through the university's infrastructure? You, do you do this through a separately incorporated development corporation? Why do you do it this way? Why do you do it that way? You know, what are the pros and cons of doing it? Because I, I fear that uh, otherwise, uh, except where there are specific collaborative relationships that are developed, for anybody else that's thinking about this community university collaboration, it's reinventing the wheel. And there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. There's now a sort of growing body of experience and expertise. And we ought to uh, think about whether this is the right mechanism or, or there are others to be able to share that. Thanks. Andrew, you're, uh, you're working in collaboration with a number of universities on different things. What's your sense here? Well, I, I was like the, the metaphor. I forget who said it about uh, hedgehogs. The universities are like hedgehogs. They cuddle together for warmth, but they don't get too close for fear they'll impale each other <laughs> by, by getting, uh, getting on each other's spines. Um, I think for us, actually, there's been quite a shift. When we first came out with our vision in 2012, it was really a differentiator for us. And I think we saw ourselves as pursuing it in isolation to a greater extent. But over the last number of years, I think uh, as, as, as we've matured and as other institutions have shown interest and developed their own strengths in this area, there has been more propensity to collaborate. And I mentioned earlier the BC Collaborative for Social Infrastructure, which McConnell helped to incentivize by encouraging four institutions to come together and share best practices where we thought we could gain and learn from each other. The, uh, I, I refer to City Studio, where, uh, where institutions are now collaborating with the city on a, uh, a, a community-based learning experience, educational experience with a research dimension. Nationally, we're working uh, through this Carnegie Initiative, trying to figure out how we can make a designation system work for, for a number of different universities. So I think it is possible. In fact, it may be easier in some respects to to collaborate on this ground, which is, is not the subject of rankings to the same extent and, and competitive pressure as say research uh, 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 income or whatever than it is in, in other areas. 
and it may provide uh, opportunities to collect for collaboration that wouldn't otherwise occur. Although the idea of having a community engagement or community partnership index to rank universities in their substantive engagement with the community would be pretty cool too. <laughs> Provide, provided it uh, provided it was an index that credited collaborative uh, development as well as individual development, I agree. Indeed, indeed. Okay. All right. We probably have time for one more question. Um, Alex, do you have anything else? Uh, how do you build internal support to persuade admins for engaging in residential development, particularly that which is not focused on your students and involves affordable housing, for example, generate less profit? So I guess I feel like there's a couple of responses to that. One is sort of a university image, university brand that the university is uh, doing values-driven community development. That's a really positive thing for uh, the community and the fact that the university is doing it and not hiding becomes a very positive thing for the university. The other argument I think is a much more uh, straight financial argument, which is um, how do you build resources long term to be able to financially stabilize your university? One of the ways that you can do that is by uh, real estate development that's going to build equity over time. Uh, so, you know, for example, right now, there's a federal housing program that provides a combination of grants and loans to be able to do affordable housing. If we engage with that sort of program, the day we open the door, we've built equity in that particular uh, building just by the value of the grant. And that's only going to increase over time as the value of the building goes up, as the mortgage gets paid down. But in a, in a world of limited uh, ability to strengthen balance sheets and build equity, uh, this becomes an opportunity. You're doing a socially valuable thing. People are seeing that your university is doing it and you're building up a, a financial nest egg that is going to benefit you 20 or 25 years down the road. All right. Well, we're going to have to, we're going to have to leave it there, guys. Um, this has been fabulous. <laughs> uh, there's so much more to talk about. We didn't get to everybody's questions, uh, but I need to wrap it up. Uh, I really want to thank our excellent uh, resource persons. They made tremendous presentations and had some very thoughtful responses. There's much more that you could uh, talk with them about. And we really want to thank you all for attending and for, uh, and we wish you a great day. So have a great day, everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Everyone for listening in. Take care.